Can you hear me well? Thank you. Well, um, good morning. Uh, our service in my church, we usually have service at 12, 1230, so this is kind of a little bit early for us. Um, I want to thank Pastor Chris very much. Uh, I don't have a congregation, so every time I, get, I don't get to preach that often, but every time I, I, I get an invitation, I get really excited. It's, it's a, it is really an honor to, to preach the Word of God. Um, a little bit about me. I am ordained the covenant. I got ordained two years ago. I'm part of the Centro Hispano de Estudios Theological staff there, um, which is our Spanish seminary for the covenant. I also work, do some work in, the, uh, in our conference, and um, this is going to be my second year being the chair of the ministerial association for our conference. So as I go, I do a little bit here and there. Uh, my family is coming with me today. So if you hear that loud voice, that, uh, that was my son. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ramsey is one of those special people that God gets to send us. You know, and, uh, and uh, sometimes he embarrasses me a little bit, but um, <laughs> most of the time I praise the Lord for his life. And my husband, Octavio, is here, and my little one went to class, so thank you very much. And um, before I begin, I would like to express my gratitude because uh, you were our host last October for our fall retreat, and uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor uh, Kurt for his hospitality, and I know a few of you were present, including... I forgot your name, the one in the sound system, <laughs> sorry, but thank you so much. It was really, really great. Um, our, I think our pastors were very blessed to enjoy your building, to enjoy the hospitality of your church and uh, Nueva Esperanza Church, so thank you very much. So the sermons for today's title, The Christian Calling, If I Do Not Watch You, You Have No Share With Me, and it is based on the Gospel of John 13, 1 through 17. Um, I'm going to read, I don't know how to, is that custom in your, in your church, but I usually ask the congregation to join me in the reading. So if you can, I'm going to be reading for the, for the new international version. If you, um, I'm going to ask you to stand up, please, to read the, the Word of God, and, and as we read it, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave his world and go to the Father. Having loved his son who were in the role, he loved them to the end. That evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon replied, just not my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body, their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for is, for is what I am. Now that I, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have, as I have done. 
Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will bless if you do them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for your call to each of your sons and daughters to be followers of your son. And we are certain that if you call us, you have provided your infallible word to lead us and that he gives necessary to serve your church and your creation. Holy Spirit, I trust you are guiding this sermon and you have prepared the hearts and minds of my brothers and sisters to hear your message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. So this is a story of, um, you know, Jesus watching his disciples' feet only happens, or we can only read it in John. As probably you know, 90% of John's um, uh, writing is unique to the gospel. And, um, and as, I, as, as I said, 90% is unique to, the, to, to this gospel. So let us situate in our story. So if you could... Um, just try to imagine being there. We know they were. We were. In, uh, we are informed by other uh, gospels that they were in what we call the upper room. Um, if you can imagine them at the table. And at this point, Jesus had been ministering for about three years. He had chosen his 12 disciples and he had been training them, hands on. Preparing them for his departure. Training them for the great commission that he would be given um, to them after his resurrection. By this time, um, the disciples had believed Jesus was the son of God, um, the Messiah. They have witnessed Jesus' miracles. They had listened to his parables. They had been taught about the rules of the kingdom of God, you know, in the Sermon of the Mount. They have learned about the treasures in heaven and that, that they needed to trust uh, God's provision instead of being worried constantly. They have watched Jesus uh, feeding thousands with a few fish and pieces of bread. And the disciples also have heard Jesus claiming to be the bread of life and the good shepherd. They have watched Jesus calming the storm, walking on wa in water. Some of them have witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus and also Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The disciples had also witnessed Jesus' persecution from the temple authorities and have listened to Jesus predict his death. So this is where we are now. So they are, they've been three years now. Now, today's scripture tells us that just before the Passover festival, um, this is what's happening that before. So following the story in the chapters ahead and consulting the other uh, gospels, we know that um, this happened during what, is, what we all know is the Last Supper, you know, this watching of the feast. In consult, consulting Luke's gospel, we know that Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So having predicted his death before, Jesus knew that the hour for him to leave this role was very near. The time to go back to his father has come. And his time to teach, to train his disciples was almost up. At this point, Jesus felt that disciples needed to witness an act of radical servant leadership. The one that he embodied. Uh, during his ministry, as you probably know, Jesus frequently demonstrated his humility. Uh, that servant leadership that sacrificial love, um, and he expected his followers to copy him, to emulate his actions. However, watching the disciples' feet was indeed a radical model of sacrificial love and humility. While in the time of Jesus, it was customary before a meal that this task was done by the lowest, lowliest of servants, Jesus being their their teacher, their leader, and he, and, and, and he know that he was divine, made this simple common act really, really a radical display of humility. 
given their, their context, the disciples wouldn't have even thought about washing each other's feet. Let alone uh, the feet of someone who lower, with lower status. Jesus took on the role of a servant to clean their, their, their field from their followers' feet, even from, from his betrayer, Jesus Iscariot. Now, all these, these actions of Jesus reveal, reveal God's character and also symbolize another cleansing that is coming up soon, the cleansing of our sins. And ultimately, in, it models how we should humble ourselves to demonstrate his love. Um, as I mentioned to you before, while all four Gospels tell us about the Last Supper, John uh, chose to write this powerful moment in his Gospel. And in the story, John uh, points to a few contextual details that make the story even more powerful. So Jesus' time on earth was almost up. Um, these were the final days with his disciples. He knew that. He said it. He was returning to his father. He also knew that Judas was about to betray him, even though he was sharing his meal there. And he absolutely knew that as his son, he had a total authority from God. Jesus knew that the father had put everything, all the things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he was sure, Jesus was very secure of who he was. These details made Jesus' actions even more significant. It was an experience he wanted to live with his disciples, and in many ways, it was a culmination of so many other things that he had taught him. And in first century Jewish culture, it represented a complete reversal of a status. Moreover, this experience embodied that he, what he had taught his disciples about loving uh, their enemies. Back in Matthew 5, um, because as, as we know, he also included Judas, his enemy, in this act of love. Watching fear was customary for many reasons. Um, you know, it's a hot weather, so people wore sandals, so a lot of them did not wear shoes at all. And um, it has, washing their feet has become also uh, a symbol of hospitality. When you had a guest, that was one of the fit, uh, first things that we do, wash their feet, you know, provide for them to wash their feet. Um, just like us, you, uh, we all have a, a rack in the entrance with a sore feet, and... Um, and, and, and it was the custom. So in Jesus' time, when these and guests uh, they came, uh, they, 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 there was this, usually this basin of water, you know, to, to, to uh, wash your feet. And usually this task, task was given to, the, to, the, to a servant. But we know that uh, this room where they were, it was a borrow's room, because in Mark 14, he, it says that um, Jesus orders his disciples to go and look for this person and ask them and tell them that the Lord was coming and to have it ready. So, so if, this, um, if preparations were made, uh, the omission of a servant to wash their feet would have been very obvious. And there would have been an, an easiness or discomfort to sitting down to have a meal without washing, um, without having their feet washed. As you can imagine, it wasn't an oversight. It would have been the elephant in the room that everyone was thinking um, through the gospel. We've seen the disciples argue about the positions of importance. And we have watched Jesus reminding them that the greatest among them should be a slave. It is very likely that disciples were thinking or remembering what Jesus teach them about service. And it seems that they all just look at each other and remain silent about this task. Because they were probably afraid Jesus would ask them to do. 
to do it, making them look like the lowest of the disciples. So it seems the disciples had not yet really understood Jesus' teachings about serving each other. So Jesus intentionally, this distinction came um, in the air for a while because scripture says that they were eating. I cannot help to think that maybe he was wishing that any of them would remember his teachings and had offered to wash everyone's feet. But it did not happen. And Jesus quietly began stripping down to perform the act himself. By now, we all know that Jesus was intentional about everything, about his words and about his deeds. Maybe you have wondered or thought that it was strange um, that he took off his outer clothing, clothing to wash people's feet. However, do, however, doing that and wrapping a towel around his waist added greater symbolism and humility to what already was an extraordinary act. At that moment, Jesus truly portrayed the role of a slave. Jesus could have begun washing his feet without all the prompts, but he wanted once and for all to drive home the message. This lesson was not just about being hospitable to one another, his intention was clearly to communicate his servant leadership style that he wanted his disciples to emulate. Jesus used as many senses as possible, sight, hearing, touch, to drive home his message on how leaders were to see themselves. By watching their feet, Jesus wanted to, to subvert the ways of the world. The act of washing someone's feet had a significant implications about the status of the people involved. There were, like I said, social, cultural expectations about who, who would wash whose feet and what that indicated about the relationship. A wife might wash her husband's feet. Children must wash their father's feet. And disciples must wa might wash their teacher's feet. But in every case, it would be an act of extreme devotion. In addition, foot washing was carried out by a servant. Um, and certainly not by anyone participating in the meal, especially if, if he or she was presiding the meal. Not even Jewish, uh, a Jewish slave um, was low enough to do the task. Whenever possible, washing feet was assigned to a Gentile slave. For all of that, Jesus washing his disciples' feet was unprecedented and subversive. Through the, act, uh, through the act of food washing, the one who was the highest, the one that had the highest position, took the position of the lowest one. Um, Luke, in chapter 22, informs us that during the Last Supper, um, the disciples, I don't know how many, a couple of them maybe, or maybe all of them, they were like bickering about who was the greatest among them. However, they felt above themselves about their position within their, their 12, uh, every one of them considered Jesus to be the greatest because he was the rabbi, their Lord, the Messiah. Peter, as is often the case, is the first to speak out. Peter is clearly, clearly uncomfortable with the situation, and Jesus used the moment to hit, hint at a greater significance. Jesus says, Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter and the other disciples did understand Jesus' actions after his death and resurrection. When Peter refused to have his feet washed, he was given an ultimatum by Jesus. He said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And in classic Peter's way, he said, well, not just my feet, but my hands and, you know, my head, to which uh, Jesus said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet um, because their body is already clean. And you are clean. He told Peter, you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew that someone whose 
the betrayer was there. Given the high stakes that Jesus gave to washing the disciples' feet, then we conclude now, you know, after all these years, that it really was a symbolic act pointing to a, spirit, a spiritual cloth, uh, cleansing that would come later as a result of another display of humility in the cross. Jesus' self-humiliation in washing his disciples' feet symbolizes his self-humiliation in accepted death upon the cross to bring about their and our cleansing from sin. That's why Peter and the rest of the disciples had to accept Jesus' humility. They couldn't escape that, even if they felt uncomfortable. They have to accept that. For if they did not, clearly, they could not be part of him. In other words, Jesus was saying to Peter that unless he was prepared to accept what he do for him in the cross, there could be no relationship between them. It was an acceptance or a rejection of Jesus and his redemptive mission. So now we know that this washing the disciples was a precursor to the sacrificial love Jesus modeled in the cross. And Jesus goes on to say that just as the Lord have done to them, they should also do to each other. Jesus intended for the disciples to display this radical, radical humility and sacrifice to one another. And we can see that this act of humility and self-sacrifice is powerful. It's very powerful. Because if the Lord, if the master is willing to humble himself by performing the lawless of tasks, then how his followers could possibly be above doing the same? Jesus was very explicit about it. We read in verses 12 to 17, um, that when he put his clothes back, he returned to the table, to the place, and he says, do you understand what I'm doing? I want you to do this as well. If I'm your teacher, if I'm your leader, and I'm willing to watch your feet, you should be willing to do the same. And you will bless if you do that. The message was clear. No one has a relationship with Jesus unless he has cleansed his or her sins, and no one can enter into the presence of the Lord unless he or she first admits to that cleansing. Moreover, later in the meal, Jesus told his disciples that displaying this humble, self-sacrificing love is how people will recognize his followers. Uh, he said in... Um, in John, uh, he said um, later in, the, in, the, in chapter 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And now we know what kind of love he's talking about. Therefore, if we truly understand Jesus' message, this is what he's saying. Behave in the same manner as I behave. Love people with sacrificial love by putting them before yourself. Jesus understood that this sacrificial love is easier when you love someone. You know, I love my kids, so I'm, I do a lot of things for him, like every parent here. I love my husband, and so I'm willing to sacrifice for him. Um, and, and Jesus understood that. That I think the most difficult task is when you come uh, to with somebody that you don't like very much, you know. <laughs> then that's uh, that like, mm, you know. But check this out. What makes sacrificial law even more poignant in this scripture is that we it clearly informs that the entire time that Jesus was performing this task, he knew that Judas was about to betray him. And still, Jesus washed his feet just like everyone else. By doing so, he showed that same sacrificial love we, uh, um, demonstrated to people we love, 
And that should be our standard to people who we don't like very much. As we know, this is easier to say than do, but that's our call. In Luke 6, um, the 30 to 35, it reads, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good thing to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Mm. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So therefore, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Um, Again, the word calls us to extend our humility toward those uh, that will never return our acts of service. Even those who will take advantage of us and will never thank us. And are, willing, are we willing to serve our enemies? What about a co-worker who got a promotion we wanted so much? Will we help her when she is in a bind with a big project? What about the pesky neighbor that's always complaining about parking? I know in Simi Valley it's not an issue, but in Los Angeles it's a big issue. And there we, all, we all have that neighbor that is constantly uh, fighting the parking. Um, would you wash her dog when she had an emergency and had to go out of town? How much, like Jesus, are we really? Of course, this is much easier to say again, and I know. I mean, certain things are just very difficult to do. Uh, and the truth is that our pride gets often in the way of leaving Jesus calling. By our own effort, we can only be able to do so far. The message is that unless we abide in Jesus and let him, and let him watch us, we have no part with him. Scripture says that not, not, not just in spite of, but because Jesus understood who he was, he washed his disciples' feet. It takes an understanding of our identity to be able to humble ourselves. The world tells us that we need to make ourselves, uh, the world tells us that we need to make uh, ourselves look in front of others that we need to lift ourselves and demonstrate how important we are. We live in a very proud and egotistical generation. It is now considered acceptable to even, and even normal for people to prom 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 promote themselves, to praise themselves, and to put themselves first. Pride in our role is considered a virtue by many. Humility, on the other hand, is considered a weakness. It seems everyone is seeking to be recognized as someone important. But the Bible is very clear. Those who exalt themselves, themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus has shown us by word and deed that we cannot call ourselves his followers if we are not willing to serve others in humility. Regardless of our position in life, we should be willing to humble ourselves and demonstrate our love to those we serve. To begin concluding, food washing is really not about food washing. It's about responding to Jesus' calls to serve others as personal sacrifice, humbling ourselves when we don't have to. It is about putting ourselves in the bottom rung through our actions and through our posture. As Jesus says, a servant is not greater than his master. And so we are not greater than Jesus. He humbled himself. We should not avoid doing likewise. 
Let us pray that the Lord give us all a servant heart that we may live a lifestyle of service. If Jesus can step down from a position of a divine position to become a man and then further himself to be a servant by washing the feet of the twelve, these twelve and their serving sinners, we are to be willing to suffer any indignity to serve him. That is true love and true humility. As Christians, we are certain that Jesus washes us clean. We also know that we fall short because we sometimes do what we are not supposed to do, and sometimes we do not do what we are supposed to. However, Jesus' call for services is renewed every day. And we know that when we bring our sins to the Lord, he is willing and able to watch us clean. All of Jesus' deeds and teachings that led up to the work on the cross, which was an act of love, because he loved them and us to the end. There he took the weight of our sins unto himself so we could be forgiven and be set free. That is our great hope. Today's scriptures tell us that we are called by our Lord to serve him through the service for others. So that one day we will share an eternal life with Jesus. And we are certain of this, of his promise because the grass withers, the floor fades, but the role of our God will stand forever. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for your eternal word. Thank you because you have called all your children to be our brothers and sisters keepers. Thank you for the gifts of service you have given to Pastor Kurt and to Simi Covenant. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness to your word. word. Please bless them and their families they represent. We ask all this in the mighty name of our King, Jesus Christ. Amen.